Good evening. This is Pastor Mike, pastor of Bimini Baptist Church in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. And I wanted to come to you this evening with a little Bible study. And uh, I believe it's going to be helpful. I believe it's going to speak to your heart. I know uh, certainly uh, through the study of this text, it has really spoken to my heart. And so what I'm going to be doing tonight is looking at Jeremiah 29, 11. Now, of all the Bible verses that are quoted and all the Bible verses that are memorized, this is one of those that is close to the top of the list. Let me read that verse for you. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's decoration, plans for your welfare, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Now, as we look at this text this evening, there's a theme here. It's all about comebacks. The Savior who uh, died for us came back to life, and he's coming back again one day for all of his kids. I heard about this little boy who was on his way to church early with his family. It was a rainy, cold day, and he was a little grumpy. He was a little upset that he was having to go, cranky that he was having to go to church. He said, I don't know why we have to go to church on Easter anyway. It's the same story every year, and it always has the same ending. Aren't you glad that we have the same ending every year? Jesus is alive. This past Sunday, we celebrated Resurrection Sunday. And so I thought that this was a good text to follow Easter Sunday. Jeremiah 29, 11 is one of the best and most beloved of all scriptures. We quote it at graduations. We quote it at funerals and other times. We marked it. Many of us have memorized it. We share it with those who are discouraged, those who are depressed, those who are in need of a word of encouragement, and yes, it is a message of hope. And especially as we live these days in 2020, I think that it is a great message of hope for us tonight. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, but I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for wholeness, now that word there is shalom, which means peace or wholeness, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Because Jesus lives, we have a future and we have a hope with him. He has delivered and conquered death. And therefore, we live in hope. We don't have to live tonight in fear. We don't have to live in dismay. We don't have to live with a cord of discouragement. We have hope because Jesus is alive. And so the Bible tells us that hope is an anchor for the soul. Now, just like an anchor is for a ship, hope is for the soul. You might be interested to know that uh, the anchor was one of the earliest Christian symbols uh, there was certainly the symbol of the cross. There was certainly the symbol of the fish. But the anchor was the early church symbol in the Christian faith. It was an adjusted cross in one sense. And they often put it and etched it on rocks. And, and, and they would go underground for Bible studies. And uh, it would be written on tombs, written on rocks. It was an anchor of hope, hope, an anchor for their soul because an anchor provides security and steadiness in the midst of the storm. And that's what we need in 2020. Certainly, that is what hope is. Hope is certainly the security uh, that our, our future rests on because the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ gives us that anchor that we can hold on to. Because of Easter, because Jesus is alive, we have an incredible hope and an incredible future. And that means when your future 
uh, seems uncertain, when your dreams die, uh, you can trust a Savior who is alive. Jesus is alive, and he keeps that hope uh, etched into our hearts day in and day out, no matter what comes our way, no matter the struggles or the turmoils or the heartaches or the sadnesses or the discouragements of life, Jesus is that hope that we all need. Hope is so much more than personal uh, or wishful thinking or personal optimism. Hope is not in ourselves. Hope is not what we can build, but our hope is in Jesus Christ. It is not in our financial security. We know how fast, how quickly that can go away. Our hope is not in our physical ability. Our hope is not in our emotional stability. Our hope is not built on our intellectual minds or our political activity. Thank God. Our hope, our certain, our sure, steadfast hope is in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Can I get an amen for that? Christ alone. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 14 says, If Christ is not ridden, risen, everything we preach, everything we say is in vain, and we are people most miserable. So our hope is in him who guarantees our future because we have trusted in him. Now, Jeremiah 29, 11 was originally written to Hebrews who were in exile in the land of Babylon because of their own sin and their own unbelief. Many of the Israelites were taken away into captivity, um, into captivity under the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, and there they were slaves in Babylon. It was a terrible predicament, and many of them, can you imagine a more hopeless situation for so many? And they even heard from the prophets, this wasn't going to be a short stay, but they would dwell in captivity in Babylon for 70 long years. Many of these would die in Babylon, and no doubt they were wondering, has God forgotten us? Does God still love us? Does God really care about my life? And that's when God delivered this message through the prophet Jeremiah, this wonderful promise that I know the thoughts that I have for you, plans that I have for you, plans not to harm you, not evil plans, but good plans for your welfare to give you a future and a hope. And that's the message tonight. That's the word I want to give to you tonight, that God is a good God and has prosperous plans for us and has no evil thoughts toward us whatsoever, but he has a future and a hope for us. Because, you see, Easter, because of Easter, God has a plan for your life and a plan for my life. God has a personal plan for you, a destiny for you, and he says, I know the plans that I have for you. Some translators give this, uh, 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 I know the thoughts that I have toward you, about you, about your family, about your future. And you know, as I think about that interpretation, it is incredible that the God of this universe is thinking about you and me. Isn't that incredible? He remembers you. He knows your name. He knows your need. He knows what you're going through. He knows your struggles. He knows every single thought that you're having tonight. Our God is an awesome God. Jesus says, even when the sparrow falls from the sky, God knows. And certainly if God cares about the birds, God cares about believers. I know the plans that I have for you. Now, uh, we forget things, don't we? We're human. Uh, my, I can't hang on to what I used to know. In fact, we often forget things we should remember, and we remember things that we ought to forget, but we tend 
to forget things. We forget special occasions. We uh, forget the birthdays. We forget anniversaries. We forget car keys. How much time do we spend looking for our car keys? We forget telephone numbers. I do know my wife's number, but I've got my wife's number, Kim's number in my phone. And thank God that I've got a contact list in my cell phone because that gets me out of trouble. I, I All I have to do is punch a button and it goes right to that person. But my friend, as much as I forget, as much as you forget, God never forgets. God remembers you. He says, I know the thoughts I have toward you. You're always on my mind, he says. Now, Willie used to sing that song. I don't know if it was true for Willie, but I know that it was true for God. When God said it, you're always on my mind. The hope of Easter is that God never fails and God never forgets. And if you find yourself like these Hebrews in bondage or in brokenness or facing suffering and death, uh, remember God cares. God really does. In this pandemic, God cares. God really does. In uh, the predicament that this nation finds itself in tonight, God cares. God really does. God loves you with an eternal, everlasting love. And God always has you on his mind and your well-being and, and the hope that he gives to your heart. And he has a future and a very prosperous one at that. The risen Lord said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I know the plans that I have for you. God does have a unique and God does have a perfect plan for every life and purpose is so necessary in life. We can't live life without purpose. If we do, it's pointless and it's full of pain. And so many people are directionless. They just seem to be going nowhere in circles. But life is meaningless without a mission, without a calling on your life. And if you are a believer, if you are a follower of Jesus, there is a purpose for you. God has a destiny for you to fulfill. And even though you may not see it just yet, even though you may not have experienced it just yet, maybe you're trying to figure out what is God doing in my life. I'm telling you, my friend, hang in there. Trust God, hope in God, wait on the Lord, and he will see you through. The psalmist said in Psalm 147, verse 11, the Lord delights in those who put their hope and trust in in his unfailing love. So there is hope um, in Easter because Jesus is alive. And because Jesus is alive, he has a plan for your life. And because God's plan for you is good, I want you to understand it is good and it is perfect. And God would choose for you what you would choose for yourself if you had all the facts. If you had all the facts, we don't have all the facts. We don't know everything there is to know, but I've got good news for you tonight. God does. The scripture says he has a plan for your welfare and not for evil. <coughs> Excuse me. I like the way the message says this plans to take care of you, not to abandon you plans for good and not for disaster. Boy, that's a great way to say this verse Plans to take care of you, that's God. Not to abandon you, that's God. He said he'd be with you and he meant it. Plans for your good and not for disaster. That's God's plan for your life. That's God's plan for my life. When Jesus died on the cross, it was disaster for his disciples. They ran and hid and many of them denying him. And all seemed lost. Jesus, their master and Lord was in the tomb after three days, they were very despondent and they walked along the Emmaus Road. Remember that? A little village outside of Jerusalem. 
and there as they walked that road, they were broken hearted and heavy hearted. And Jesus joined them and they didn't recognize that he was Jesus at that particular moment for reason because they had unbelief. Jesus said, certainly their eyes were clouded with despair, but they didn't recognize that Jesus was walking with them. And so he went along and he said, why are you so sad? And they said, where have you been? Don't you know what has happened? They've killed Jesus, the Messiah. We had hoped that he was the one we had hoped that he would deliver us. We had hoped that he would be the one that would save us. The closest followers of Jesus were nowhere to be found. But then the news began to hit the streets. The tomb was empty. Let me say it again. The tomb was empty. The stone was rolled away. The women went to the tomb early and reported he is not here. And an angel told us that he is risen. Wow. The disciples ran to the tomb, Peter and John, and they saw the empty tomb and the grave clothes neatly folded and the word began to get out. He's alive. He's alive. The enemies of Christ began to hear it. The very ones who crucified him, put him on the cross, heard the words, the tomb is empty, he is risen. And because Jesus was alive, my friend, hope was reborn. I want to say that again. Because Jesus was alive, hope was reborn. Hope is alive again. And because Jesus is alive in 2020, 2,000 plus years later, we can still say, praise God, the tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. And because he is alive, he can take care of what we're going through tonight. All the things that we're struggling with tonight, he's able. He's able to do abundantly, sufficiently more than we could ever think or ask. He's a great God. He's a mighty God. In this God, I trust. He died and he rose again on the third day. And he's the only God that we have. The future is with us. Defeat and death and sin and sorrow and hell is defeated. We have a future and we have a hope and we have good news tonight. This is the anchor. We go back to where I started at tonight. This is the anchor. This is our security. Lifeline for our souls that steadies us in the storm. How can I be calm in 2020 with all the pandemic things going on? How can I remain calm in the midst of an unprecedented day? Because I know who lives in my life. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, my friend. He steadies us. He secures us in every crisis. He's securing us tonight. He's steadying us tonight. His thoughts for you are good, even when it doesn't look good. Bad Friday. We call it Good Friday now because we not only look to the cross, we look through the cross and we see an empty tomb. That's why it's good. Friday when it happened wasn't good, but today we see it as good because we know that Jesus had to die to live. He had to die to be raised from the grave. He had to die to fulfill the prophets of the Old Testament. What a God, what a mighty God we serve. And we look through the cross and we see an empty tomb and God took a very bad day and turned it into a very great and glorious day on Easter morning when Jesus got up. And that is what God is doing in our lives tonight. As I share this message, this is what God is doing in my life and your life tonight. 
in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of of everything going on, and I, I'm sitting in my house tonight, and I'm preaching to an iPhone. I never thought I'd have to do this on a Wednesday night. For 33 years, I've been going to a church building on Wednesday nights. On Sunday nights, on Sunday mornings, I'm spending my time in a parking lot. Now God is doing something. God is doing something new. God is doing something out of the box and the realm of what I really thought was possible. God is doing something in the midst. And I really believe this past Sunday that more people heard the gospel in the world than at any Easter Sunday in the history of the world. And God allowed all of that to happen through what we see as something bad, but God turns it into good. Do you understand what I'm saying tonight? Things are different, and we'll probably open up in a few weeks, a couple of weeks maybe. I'm hoping that we can get back inside the church building real soon and get back to some kind of normalcy, but I wonder if God is trying to take the church out of the box in 2020 to send the greatest revival this world has ever seen. I wonder. I wonder what God is up to. You see, God turned a very bad day into a glorious and great day on that Easter Sunday morning, and God is doing some work in our lives tonight. He's working all things together. For his glory and his good, and we need to understand that tonight. Those who love the Lord and those who are called according to his purposes, God is up to something very, very good. Jeremiah 29, 11 is a promise from God. We can count on this promise from God to give you a future and a hope. There are thousands of promises in the Bible. Some say as many as 7,000 promises in the Bible. God has promised because of the resurrection to keep every single one of them. Everything God says is true. He promised I will die on a cross, but on the third day I'm coming back, I'll be alive again. He kept that promise. And if he kept that promise, don't you know that he'll keep every promise he's ever made? Every promise he's ever made. Every promise he's made for you. Every promise he's made for me. Every promise from God is true. And you can accept the guarantee tonight to live in that hope and to live in every promise that God has made. Jesus came out of the tomb and the tomb is empty. And because the tomb is empty, we can face tomorrow. We can face today. We can make it. We're in this journey as children of God together. And God is doing something. God is turning what the world may view as a crisis and a time of panic, God is making something good of it. Something good of it. And folks, we've got to trust God because God has said in his word, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He's got plans for us. You're on his heart, I'm on his heart, and he's taking care of of your life and my life, your family and my family. And God is consistently the same and hasn't changed. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever the same. He's God and he hasn't left his throne for one millimeter uh, of a second. He's there. And so tonight, as we look at Jeremiah 29, 11, be encouraged. Be strengthened in the Lord Jesus. 
Know that he is able to do it exceedingly, abundantly, beyond what we could ever think or ask. He's God. And he is at work in your life and my life. And he has promised to take care of us. We need to trust him during these days. He will come through for his kids. I want to go into a time of prayer now as we come to the close of our time together in the next uh, five or so minutes. I want to pray, but before I pray, I just want to share a word of invitation. If you don't have a place to attend uh, this coming uh, Sunday, uh, we're having drive-in church uh, each Sunday at 1030 in our parking lot. We're keeping everyone safe, uh, just a skeleton crew of a parking attendants and worship team, uh, sound people. We're, we're keeping just a few people uh, that are essentially needed uh, outside of their cars. But everyone else is inside their car, safe environment, social distancing. We're parking cars six feet apart. And uh, so we're, we're just having... Uh, church outside, and God is blessing uh, this coming Sunday. And the reason I wanted to pause for uh, a word of invitation this coming Sunday, I don't know that God has in 33 plus years of pastoring and preaching, I don't know that God has ever given me a stronger message than this coming Sunday's message. I'll be preaching. This is not a bad day for God. This is not a bad day for God from Psalm 121. And I want to invite you to come out and be with us this coming Sunday as we worship through music and through the uh, written and spoken word of God. I hope that you'll join us if you can. If you have your church, uh, please by all means support your church you need to. Uh, but if you don't have a place, I wanted to give you a personal invitation tonight. We're going to go and uh, right into prayer time now. So let me pray as we close our time tonight out. Dear Father, tonight we are thankful for Jeremiah 29, 11. We are thankful that we're on your mind. We're on your heart. You haven't forgotten us. You love us. You have a plan for us. And that's a good plan, a perfect plan. And we're grateful for it. Dear Father, I believe there may be someone listening, either right now or will listen later, that needs a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't have security. They don't have a stabilizer in their life. And they need one. And Lord, I pray that they'll acknowledge their sin, acknowledge that Jesus died for their sin, and that three days later, he arose from the grave and he did it all for them because he loved them. And I pray that they will enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Dear Father, I pray for our nation. I pray for our world. I pray for our president, President Trump and Vice President Pence and all the decisions that they'll be making in the coming days. I pray for all our governors, uh, 50 states. I pray as they make decisions that will govern their states. I pray for uh, Governor Cooper right here in North Carolina and, and other governors as they make decisions uh, related to their states. I pray for our health care workers, frontline people. Keep them safe. Keep them out of harm's way. Thank you. Bless them for what they're doing. I thank you for our first responders, and I, I just am so grateful for them. And uh, they are out there also on the front lines. Uh, our grocery store and food workers, 
our restaurant workers, our truck drivers that are so essential. And right on down the list, I may leave somebody out. I pray for our churches. I pray for our pastors. These are different days for us as well. And I pray for them. And dear Father, we pray for healing in this land. Not only physical healing. We pray for spiritual. We pray, uh, Lord, that you will heal this nation and this world spiritually. And even in the midst of these pandemic days, that you will send a great wave of revival to this world, to our land. And dear Father, again, uh, we love you supremely. We love you beyond measure. And Lord, I pray that you will be with us, protect us, guard us, keep us in your care. And again tonight, we thank you for the promise of Jeremiah 29, 11. We thank you for the word of God. And we thank you that it has pricked not only my heart tonight, but I believe other hearts listening. We love you, Lord Jesus. And we pray that you will send a cover of protection upon the world that you created. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining in tonight uh, with this uh, broadcast and for this Bible study. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that some principle uh, spoke to your heart. And dear father uh, and, and, and dear friend, I, I pray that you've been encouraged tonight. Um, love you, praying for you, hang in there, be encouraged, and know that I love you, and so does God. God loves you supremely. Good night.